With wealth inequality in America at an all-time high and congressional approval ratings at an all-time low, it's no wonder why people are worried about the future of this country. Today, money not only means power, it means political speech. And the more wealth is consolidated at the top, the less people feel they have the power to change the system. Despite the wealthy and powerful interests working against the people all the time, there are still plenty of steps we can take right now, right here, to democratize our local economies. So here to break down what exactly those steps are, I'm joined by a professor of political economy at the University of Maryland, Gar Alperovitz. Thank you so much for coming on, Al. Thanks for having Gar, me. Gar, sorry. Um, Gar, you used to research foreign policy, starting with World War II all the way to Vietnam, kind of analyzing the U.S. empire um, crimes. What inspired your switch to domestic economics? Well, I think unless we change the system totally from the bottom up, we're going to have international expansionism, imperialism, a bombing of the kind we're seeing. Uh, I move back to the heart of the question that is the nature of the political economy and I think the, the last discussion of how we actually aim at changing the system is, is the only answer to the ultimate inter foreign policy questions too. Mm. And, and you co-authored an article with Keenbot, um, 10 Ways to Democratize Your Local Economy. It goes with your book, What Then Must We Do? Um, pretty much a playbook on how to do this, <laughs> Gar. Uh, number one in the article is putting your money in local credit unions. Talk about this concept. What is a credit union and what would it do to democratize the community? Uh, a credit union, and we have you know, many people, there's 130 million Americans who have democratized wealth. That's a co-op. One person, one vote, bank is a credit union. They've got, if you take them all together, they have more money than the big New York banks, any one of them. Wow. And uh, there they are. You can move your money out of a bank and put it into a credit union, which is a democratic bank. And you can go a little further, which some people in some parts of the country are doing too. They are one person, one vote. You can get your friends together, go to the board meeting, and you can become the board of a one person, one vote bank and begin investing in co-ops and other things that begin to show people a different direction towards the overall system, stepping, starting at the bottom. And why is the call to fix these too big to fail, too big to regulate banks not enough? Well, I think what's going to happen with the banks, if, even if they break them up, they'll reconsolidate. That's what happened with Standard Oil and AT&T. So at some level, they're going to have to be turned into either public co-ops and I think people are going to get angry enough to do that, or nationalized, but that's the ultimate solution. But building from the bottom up, giving people an idea of what it means, that's the way you begin to build education by doing and then pointing towards larger and larger issues. Uh, the book is not, and the strategy is not just at the bottom, it's how do we build over time to move to the big ones as well. Absolutely. Uh, let's talk about another initiative in the article, which is taking back your local government through participatory budgeting. Yeah. Talk about this concept. How would this work? This is very interesting. It started out in Brazil, in Porto Alegre. That is to say, why, does it, why can't the ordinary citizen be involved in the allocation of government money? Why not? And so you can set that up. In fact, three cities, New York does about $10 million that way. In Chicago, one of the aldermen has set up his district to do it that way. Vallejo, California, they do very large scale. Citywide budgeting is beginning to be done that way. Changing the nature of the lobbyists who come in to the city council, having ordinary people make those decisions is possible. And again, we're pointing from the bottom up and moving up nationally. Those are the kind of things we can build up to if we learn from the bottom up over time. You know, those case studies are really fascinating, the one that you cited in the article. Um, how would we even begin to do something like that in Washington, D.C.? I mean, what's the first step with the participatory budgeting? Well, Washington, the first step would be to go to, go to the, the council and begin petition, get a referendum saying, we want to do this with X number of dollars or in some neighborhoods or parts of it, just beginning making the demand. It's being done in other cities all over the world. It's being done. Why can't we do it here? Good question, Gar, and really how amazing would it be to control our, our <laughs> taxes? <laughs> Taxation without representation. We could do something about that, at least locally. Um, recently, Boulder, Colorado just voted to uh, put their electricity under public control. This is an incredible feat to produce more renewables. Could this be replicated around the country as well? I, I think that is what's interesting about Boulder. Boulder had two big fights. They won one by just a fraction of the vote. And then, of course, the corporations came in on them. This is all done mainly by young people, a lot of students involved. And the next time around, two to one vote, and they won it. And they're turning it from you know, coal fire and oil fire 
over to renewables, and it's a very serious operation. There's discussion in Pittsburgh and Minneapolis. Many cities could do this in picking up on the Boulder How do they exactly do it? Well, the referendum was the first step, and then getting get another referendum was forced, and then they organized. They really did organize brilliantly. So what you're saying is we have to get up and do something yeah. <laughs> about this system and take action. I mean, it really is through these referendums and That's through these right. local actions that you can take. I don't think people realize how much power they have. That, what they don't, the press doesn't cover this, but this is going on all over the country. Right. That's what the book, What Then Must We Do, is about. That's what the paper I did with Keen is about. There's a lot going on with co-ops, worker-owned companies, public banks that the press doesn't cover, but can be done. Right. And you can, if they can do it in Boulder, if you can do it in Chicago, you can do it where you are. There's fights being won all across the nation, yeah. all across the world against the corporatocracy, Agar. Uh, let's talk about another prescription in the article and in the book about nonprofit institutions like universities and hospitals. Um, you're talking about how they can use their resources to fight things like unemployment, poverty, even global warming. Right. How, how would that work? How, what would the incentivization <laughs> What's the, yeah, how would they be incentivized, basically? Well, part of them being pushed. <laughs> That's a, this is a good one for students because, on one hand, challenging them to stop investing in energy companies which are polluting and creating the climate change. But the other part of it is hospitals and universities, particularly, buy a lot of things. In Cleveland, for instance, there's a hospital, the university, the hospital, Cleveland Clinic, and then Case Western Reserve University, right in the middle of a very poor neighborhood. They buy $3 billion in goods and services plus their investment, plus their salary, just what they buy. So there in that city, uh, there's been an initiative to buy from worker-owned companies in a very poor part of the city to create worker ownership using procurement. Students can make that happen in many universities. They can say, stop investing in the big guys, start buying from worker co-ops, start building up poor neighborhoods. That also is happening, and the press covers very little of it, but it is do it's doable, it's being done, and it's another precedent for democratizing ownership and, and building a different vision of where we're going. Beautiful. I think decades ago, if someone saw the corporatization and private takeover of hospitals and universities, they'd say that's sociopathic, and here we are with actual corporate names taking right. over hospitals. And would that be done through referendums as well? through it, the school, through... Uh, uh, any, any, any track that gets you there. <laughs> yeah. the referendum is one, but yeah. just pressure. Right. And, and in some cases, you find universities and hospital administrators welcome the idea. They're, they've just been locked into an old pattern and say, well, why not? We can do that here, and, and that's what I think's happened in some parts of Cleveland. Beautiful. What other communities are practicing efforts like these that could serve as a blueprint for the rest of the country? Again, as I say, the, the press just doesn't co cover it. Pittsburgh is do developing this. Cincinnati's developing it. There are three in the Washington area, Washington, D.C. area is developing it. Amarillo, Texas, number of cities, 100 cities have already made inquiries to do the Cleveland, what's called the Cleveland model of worker co-ops supported by the purchasing of, of hospitals and universities. So it's beginning to spread all over the country now. And I think you're going to see more of it. Again, young people could really make it happen at universities if they begin putting the pressure on and telling them, you know, this is being done lots of places. Why don't we get on the bandwagon and start doing it? Gar, I think, I think the first step is that you know, people are just so overwhelmed. Where do they even go? How do they meet up with people to, to start these referendums, right. start these movements of pressure? What's your recommendation? First thing, resources, tools, we have about a minute left. Okay, well, the book, What Then Must We Do, is filled with these kinds of examples. That's why we wrote mm -hmm. it. Website, What Then Can I Do? That's this 10 lists of things that Keen and I put together. Another website is called www.community-wealth, put the dash in, .org and you'll find thousands of examples of this kind of thing that you can do and, and build up. And again, the notion is not just local, but how do we begin getting ideas that can be applied? You know, before the New Deal, the national things were done in the state and local laboratories, and then they became national ideas. That's the concept here, not just local. We're going national with a long buildup over time. Beautiful. This is exactly what we need. We need to start local, grassroots, bottom up. Let's take this country back one community at a time. Gar Alperovitz, thank you so much. Everyone check it out. What then must we do and what I do. Great, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me.